Today on Straight Talk Africa, the South Sudan peace process collapsed last week. This following an international deadline on March 5th. Observers insist the two principles must set aside their differences and end the conflict. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa. It's Wednesday, March 11th. I am Shaka Sali. And hello, Shaka, and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Maria Madialo, your social media reporter. Today, we'll talk about the implications of the stored South Sudan peace talks in the Ethiopian capital of Addis Ababa. We have a lot to delve into on today's program. Coming up later in our STA inbox, we'll share some thoughts from our audience who sent in emails, Facebook, and Twitter comments. We'll reveal some of them ahead on Straight Talk Africa. But first, the people of South Sudan continue to suffer greatly due to the ongoing political turmoil and violence brought about by the government and the rebel group, SPROM, in opposition. My colleague, Paul Sisko, has more. Sorry for the technical difficulties and now joining us here in our Washington studios are two distinguished guests. Garang Ding Okong, the South Sudanese ambassador to the United States. I have to say frankly, uh, Ambassador Garang, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be on your show and happy to your, uh, your listeners and viewers. It's a pleasure. And of course, uh, John Tanza Mabusu, managing editor and host of South Sudan, in focus, the voice of America's 30 minute weekly English language to Africa. It's a pleasure, of course, having you again. Thank you, Shaka. It's Street always a pleasure Africa. to be on this show. Well, I gather that uh, we can now go for the package. Uh, so the people of South Sudan continue to suffer greatly due to the ongoing political turmoil and violence brought about by the government and the rebel group SPROM in opposition. My colleague Paul Sisko has more. For many South Sudanese citizens, any signs of hope for peace in the world's youngest nation were again dashed after talks between President Salva Kiir and his longtime rival Riek Machar collapsed in Addis Ababa without a deal. Political discord between the two leaders has brought ethnic violence, and now there uh -huh. appears to be no resolution to the standoff in sight. A leaked African Union document says a transitional government is needed in South Sudan and that neither Kier or Mashar should serve in it, reportedly because of their alleged responsibility for the, quote, organized massacres and large-scale violence, end quote. South Sudanese rebel leader and former Vice President Rick Machar says the government is not willing to change its position. We have done our best to uh, arrive uh, to a peace agreement, but it has not become possible because the position is being contested by the government. President Salva Kiir had little comment. I have no comment. Michael McQuay, a spokesperson for the government of South Sudan, denies that the talks were a major setback. I don't agree with the conclusion that the talks have failed, but we say we are suspending the talks for further consultations. 
Sayum Mesfin is chief mediator for the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. The level of damage of confidence, the level of mistrust that you see between these leaders is, is, is unbelievable. And they have not been able to overcome this, to forgive with each other and excuse their people by cutting a deal and an agreement to transform the country into a peaceful one ruled by constitutional rules. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon expressed profound disappointment at the talk's conclusion, and the U.S. State Department strongly condemned the lack of political leadership to resolve this man-made conflict. Earlier, the U.N. Security Council adopted a resolution to impose limited sanctions on South Sudan, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Samantha Power. Those who frustrate peace must begin to pay the price. More peace talks are expected, but no date has been scheduled. Meanwhile, the death toll is mounting. Over 10,000 people have been killed. The UN believes there were 12,000 child soldiers involved in the conflict there last year. Upwards of 2 million people have been displaced, and an estimated 2.5 million South Sudanese are facing severe food shortages. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. And before we begin our discussion, I am now joined by the former Vice President of South Sudan, Dr. Riyak Machar, currently the Chairman of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement in opposition. He joins us by a telephone link up from Addis Ababa. Good evening, Dr. Machar. Good evening, Chako. How are you today? Well, I'm okay, physically. Okay. I see. Well, you've been fighting for over a year now, Dr. Machar, and there are a lot of people, frankly, who were hoping that uh, you would meet uh, the deadline of the talks, which was last week on Thursday, March 5th. Why didn't you sign on the deal? Well, there was no agreement to be signed. There was no deal. I am disappointed like the rest of the the South Sudanese people, and also the rest of the world. So there was no deal on the table. Are you suggesting that uh, whatever you were supposed uh, uh, to append your signatures on was not something perhaps that uh, reflected the fundamental root causes of the problems of South Sudan? You know, we... Uh, from our viewpoint, there are three fundamental issues. The system of governance, we have suggested that we move from the current system to a federal system. On principle, there is agreement, but when we come to details, there is disagreement. As they usually say, the devil is in the details. Uh, the second issue is the security arrangements. As you know, the country is split. Uh, after December 16th, the, con the country split uh, politically, even the security organs, the army, national security, the police, and the rest, they split. Even the, the public uh, service is split. So we, 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 we did not see a deal that would uh, crack this, that will uh, give adequate security arrangements for all to be confident of. Uh, number three, the, you know that the AU has refused to publish its report on the conflict in South Sudan because a commission was formed. The, the AU has not published or made public this, this report. Uh, everybody has been asking for it to be made public and because it would address the issues of accountability, justice, reconciliation, healing, and even institutional reform. All in all, we, we couldn't agree on these issues of accountability. So there was no deal on the table ready. I have seen uh, the leaked report of the African Union Commission, of course, uh, which was led by former Nigerian uh, President uh, General Orushegun Obasanjo, retired but certainly not tired and uh, among other things actually it indicates that uh, 
The report uh, would like to see uh, President Salva Kiir and Dr. Riyak Machar uh, stepping aside, not participating uh, in uh, the proposed, for example, transitional arrangement. Have you heard about that? Yeah, I, I heard about that. My, my, my concern is, what have I done wrong? I am the victim. I am the aggrieved. Uh, the, the person who planned the massacre in Juba is President Salva Kiir. So if his punishment is to ensure that he does not participate in the transitional government of national unity, what is my, what, what, what is my fault there? I was, I was chased away. I, the, the world proved that there was no coup as claimed by the government. Uh, and the massacre, um, a massacre was committed in Juba by the president using his own troops, and I believe Ambassador Garan knows about it. To what extent, uh, Dr. Riyak, uh, would you say you have confidence in IGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, as a neutral or non-partisan mediator in as far as the talks are concerned? Well, I don't think that IGAD is uh, non-partisan or neutral. You know that Uganda is part of the, the talks at the, at the level of the summit, and the, Uganda is part of the conflict, is fighting all over South Sudan, uh, starting from the Equatoria, uh, Greater Panayla, now, Greater Bahar is part of the war, so, and it is also part of the resolution of the conflict. So you can't describe it as a neutral body uh, that is IGAD. Uh, but we have, we have accepted uh, to negotiate under such uh, uh, a system, yes. How do you respond to some who will say that uh, Peace talks between uh, President Salva Kiir and Dr. Riyak Machar, really, is like uh, a couple planning a political marriage while concentrating on, on political divorce. Well, you see, I have told you the, the fundamental issues which we would like to address, and they are here. Uh, one, uh, this is system of governance. We have proposed federalism. They have accepted it in principle, but we differ in the details. We have, we, we, we have also said we need to address the security issues by having secure, uh, adequate security arrangements. This is, this, is, this is important for all the people in South Sudan. And then the accountability agenda. Uh, I... Uh, I think this, this if, we, if we reach an agreement uh, on these three issues and the other procedural issues uh, related to them, uh, we, we should strike a deal, but we haven't. Again, uh, uh, looking at uh, the AU uh, Commission leaked report, uh, which obviously has not been uh, released publicly, uh, it would seem that uh, the mediators, in fact, had done their job and uh, they had actually put out uh, a deal that probably you and a lot of others could have lived with, but apparently the deal was changed by uh, the heads of IGAD. Uh, I'm talking about the presidents and the prime minister of Ethiopia. Have we heard about that? Well, you know, one, one of the difficulties in the IGAD mediation is the complication which comes in when the when the summit is called? They had they had called several summits, and uh, we find ourselves negotiating with the heads of the state and government uh, at every summit, and 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 the, at most of the time, and specifically on the 25th of August, uh, this was the case when even the mediators were sidelined. So we have problems. So what do you sincerely finally think that uh, must happen 
in order for you to stop and end the fighting so that the ordinary people of South Sudan, in fact, the vast majority of South Sudanese, can again begin to live their lives in peace and harmony. Dr. Riak. We want, we want to strike a peace agreement uh, still under this imperfect uh, mediation system, uh, the IGAT, and, uh, but we know that the, the talks collapsed and there was a declaration that this uh, uh, mechanism did not yield fruits, but a new mechanism will be uh, introduced. So we're waiting for the new me mechanism so that we can resume the talks. I see. Well, we're going to have to stop right there. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Riak Machar, chairman of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement in opposition, who joined us on the telephone link up from Addis Ababa. We will now pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website Twitter, and we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka, and join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA South Sudan. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please don't go away. The conflict in South Sudan started in December 2013 when Salva Kiir from the ethnic Dinka group fired then Vice President Riek Machar and ethnic Noor and accused him of plotting to overthrow the regime. Machar denied the allegations and accused Kiir of carrying out violent purges. The accusations sparked violence among the two ethnic groups causing the death of thousands and leaving millions displaced. Several NGOs have accused both warring sides of committing crimes against humanity, including mutilation, rape, and extrajudicial executions. President Kier has warned that the country is at risk of famine if the violence continues. As Nigeria heads to the polls March 28th, Voice of America reporters head to the field covering the election campaigns and the issues for Nigeria and all of Africa. Turn to Voice of America for the facts. Nigeria decides 2015. What happens there matters throughout Africa. VOA has the largest team of international journalists in Nigeria and surrounding countries, counting down to the March 28th election and beyond. VOA's Nigeria Decides 2015 coverage is on radio with Daybreak Africa. Africa News Tonight and Nightline Africa. On television with Africa 54 and Straight Talk Africa. And stay on top online. Go to voanews.com. Special Nigeria Decides 2015 coverage is underway now. A commitment to Africa from Voice of America. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111, U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question, keep your comment brief, and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizui. And today we are talking about the implications of the stored South Sudan peace talks in Addis Ababa, the seat of the African Union. Our distinguished guests are Garang Ding Akwong, the South Sudanese ambassador to the United States, and John Tanza Mabusu, managing editor and host of South Sudan in Focus, the Voice of America 30 Minutes weekday English language radio internet broadcast which airs Monday through Friday at 7.30 p.m. East African time. Once again, uh, my fellow East Africans, you're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thank you're you, most sir. welcome. Uh, Galang, it's been a very, very long time since uh, 
you used to follow Straight Talk Africa. How do you feel now that you are on the set yourself? That's three um, on, the, on the program. Terrific. I've been uh, a fan of the program since the 90s. Really? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I have to say that uh, the feeling is mutual. I'm glad that uh, we could actually have you in the studio. You, you just heard uh, your compatriot, uh, a former, of course, vice president uh, of your country, talk about how, in fact, there was no deal. Come Thursday, there was no deal worth signing, really. How do you react to that, uh, yeah, th Mr. Ambassador? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my reaction would be that uh, we are all disappointed that there was no deal uh, in, uh, in Addis Ababa. Mm -hmm. uh, but since we are still talking, mm. uh, we are hoping that one day we'll uh, arrive to a deal. Uh, but let me uh, also comment on the points raised by Dr. Riyag Mashar. Uh, I and Dr. Riyag Mashar have been in this government uh, since 2010. Mm -hmm. So we know what happened uh, in the government, we know what happened uh, to, in the time leading to the, the crisis. Yes. Uh, Dr. Masha will recall that uh, in March 2013, mm -hmm. he and uh, Group 11 called for a meeting mm -hmm. in the presidency mm -hmm. where they called the president. He himself was there. Mm -hmm. uh, Pagan was there. Mm -hmm. Bengalor was there. Mm -hmm. And they called for the president to step down. That mm -hmm. was way, way back before the the crisis. Was that uh, the, press, the famous press conference? Not. I'm coming to that. Mm -hmm. That was on uh, third. Not, not third. That was in, in, in March mm -hmm. 2013. Then, in that meeting, they called the president to, to, to step down, and each one of them expressed his desire and her, to, to lead the, the, the South. Yes. The president told them that he didn't have any problem. Mm -hmm. But let us go back to our institutions, mm -hmm. which are the SPLA, SP, I mean the SPLM, mm -hmm. Congress, mm -hmm. and then the people of South Sudan. Mm. That was the meeting of March. In July, in July the 4th, Dr. Riyak Mashar gave interview to Reuters, mm -hmm. in which, this is the Reuters, Reuters reporter, mm -hmm. The deputy leader of a newly independent South Sudan has issued a veiled warning to the country's Western Bank president, Salfa Kiir, telling him to stand down and vowing to replace him before or after the election by 2015. Right. This was July mm -hmm. before the crisis. This is uh, 2013? This was 2013. Yeah, we know. That, was, that was the build-up. Uh, to the to, to Maria Victoria uh, coup. Cool. Then mm. in December. In December. December 15. This, yeah, when the president was in, in France. Mm -hmm. Himself and others went to SPLM headquarters and called the president by by all of by all names. Right. He's a dictator, he's, right. he's a failure and right. all this. Then what did you what, what what do anybody expect from a leader to do? I hear what you're, so, I hear what you're so saying, Mr. Victoria Ambassador. cannot claim that he's, he's innocent when he has been building up for the climax of, of 2015. In other words, it really takes two to tango. Yes. What, what do you think uh, about this, John? Uh, uh, we obviously uh, cannot deny the fact that some of these things occurred, but what about the fact that uh, perhaps we should, in fact, compare those things that occurred then to frankly the suffering that your cousins your mothers your fathers your aunts are going through well shaka before the conflict developed to what it is right mm -hmm. now it was a disagreement within the political party mm -hmm. the ruling party right um dr Riak and uh, some other members of the party like pagana moon were uh, those Madame, members of the political bureau? He, yes, the members of the political bureau mm -hmm. came up and called for a convention because these are some of the party mechanism mm. for, you know, elections and reforms and democracy within the party. Mm. But this um, party convention was postponed several times. And then Dr. Riek and the rest of the other members of the political bureau mm. reminded President Kir that it's time 
for us to have this convention so that we can address some other party issues. And that is where the problem all started. And to come to your question about the suffering of the people, when I was in Addis, I spoke to several stakeholders, uh, you know, civil society groups, uh, faith-based groups, and even the youth, when I asked them, how do people at home feel? And the answer is people are disappointed. They want an end to this fighting because they did not expect mm. independent South Sudan to be an arena of fighting. Mm -hmm. They wanted to enjoy what they call the freedom that they have been fighting for. They want to enjoy the fruits of the freedom. And so the common sentiment from people at home is that this fighting must end. How do you respond to um, some people, frankly, who have been saying that uh, uh, the only reason, for example, why South Sudan is um, an independent sovereign nation today is largely because at one time you had a uniting factor. You had a uniting factor, Khartoum, uh, because you had, according to these reports, a very, very strong hatred of Khartoum, but that since you separated from Khartoum, there is what they call lack of a vision to change society into a viable democratic entity built on the idea of a common future. Well, I will agree to some extent with those uh, predictions because what South Sudan went through right after independence is a post-conflict scenario. Mm -hmm. When a country goes into a conflict, after the conflict there's, there are lots of issues that need to be addressed. There are issues of democracy, issues of nation building, issues of human resource, issues of uh, distribution of wealth, and the list is just endless. And so right after independence, the post-conflict scenario was not handled the right way. Right. There was a scramble for positions, if you like. Everybody wants to be in the top seat. Everybody is struggling to secure a job in the government. In fact, in South Sudan, the government is the only employer. Most people want to work with the government. But the truth of the matter is, when the people of South Sudan were fighting the long war with Khartoum, mm. of course, there were a lot of things that were swept under the carpet postponed, if you like. They would say, let us finish with our common enemy first, and then we will come to address these issues. And these issues were prolonged for quite a long time, and that's why it erupted. For instance, it's uh, an open secret that some communities in South Sudan don't, co don't coexist uh, peacefully from time immemorial mm -hmm. due to the nature of their social and uh, you know, socioeconomic um, uh, activities. For instance, take example of uh, cattle keepers. Pastoralists. Yes, they don't see each other eye to eye. I mean, With cultivators. Yes. But that's not unique to South Sudan because you have the same uh, dynamics, for example, in Rwanda. You have the same dynamics in Burundi. You have the same dynamics, as a matter of fact, uh, in parts of my country, Uganda. Yeah, but the issue with South Sudan is there's been lack of institutions, of governance, that will address your issues. If you steal my property, I can go to court and you should be taken to court. But the courts in South Sudan are compromised. In fact, a lot of analysts are saying the judiciary is partisan. So where do you go? Which court do you go to, you know, bring your cases there in case your animal is stolen? So in the absence of a system, people then take refuge in their community for protection because they mm -hmm. think where they are, their brothers and sisters will rally behind them to fight whoever wants to come and uh, attack them or take their property. And that's why the situation of South Sudan is a little bit peculiar. In fact, some observers have gone to the extent of saying that... Uh, the only thing that the government uh, in Juba has accomplished so far is, uh, is basically uh, institutionalizing corruption and impunity. Is that something you'd like to respond to, Mr. Ambassador? Uh, th th thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, the issues you have raised and my friend here has responded to 
are issues of post-independence, as he said, mm. and especially countries that emerge for, from wars. Right. Our independence was not uh, peaceful independence. It came through wars. Certainly not, yeah. So there were a lot of uh, infrastructure that were, that were destroyed. Yes. S schools were destroyed, roads were destroyed, hospitals were destroyed. So we were trying to rebuild the country. Can we come a little also, bit I'm, I'm, uh, back to that later because time is not our best ally? Yeah. You're tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment. But first, here is Mariama Jaro. Take it away, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the outstanding and fantastic feedback we've received from our audience through social media from across the African continent. But now, here is our letter of the week. Omunua Okubo from Abuja in Nigeria writes... Many steps can and should be taken to bring peace and prosperity to South Sudan. President Salva Kiir and opposition leader Riek Machar should de-emphasize fame, power, money and stress the importance of developing South Sudan. The country's officials should now craft a road map to development that is acceptable to all ethnic and religious groups in the country. The development of South Sudan is what matters most and not who occupies the state house. Finally, the African Union should take the initiative and play a mediatory role in South Sudan's peace process. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number 202-619-3111. And the U.S. country code is 1. Call direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to keep your questions brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther Gizu, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Maria Mam. Take it away again, Maria Mam. Well, thanks, Shaka. Talks to end 15 months of conflict in South Sudan are at a standstill after discussions collapsed last Friday without an agreement violating a March 5th deadline imposed earlier by mediators. It was the latest blow to peace efforts in the political dispute between President Salva Kiir and his former vice president, Riek Machar. Mediators say they could not persuade either side to make a meaningful compromise. Well, this leads us to our question of the week, asking what steps can be taken to end the continuous rivalry between President Salva Kiir and former vice president and rebel leader, Riek Machar? Well, first of all, thank you uh, all for using our social media platforms to give us your thoughts. Let's begin with a comment from Michael Babu Duki from Kampala, uh, Uganda, who writes, The rivalry between President Salva Kiir and Riek Machar is just one of the latest manifestations of political greed by African leaders. The only real solution is for the two principles to, e to exit the political stage in South Sudan and allow more citizen-leaning and development-oriented leaders to take the lead and move Africa's youngest nation forward. Well, another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Use the hashtag VOA South Sudan. And if you haven't yet, please follow us on Twitter. And speaking of it, uh, let's go to a tweet uh, from a Czech, uh, Ibn Umar, who writes, Number one, restore hope. Bold, painful, unilateral concessions by Kier and Machar and number two, appoint a high-profile personality as sole mediator. Well, let's look at another tweet uh, from Lawrence uh, Swider, who asked, What is the current thinking about how to resolve the tensions over the disputed oil-rich region of Abie? Well, Shaka, Your Excellency, and my colleague, uh, John Tanza, you have the floor. 
Well, what about that, uh, Mr. Ambassador? Your reaction? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I was saying that uh, the government has accomplished a lot of things uh, during this uh, period, mm -hmm. between 2010 and, two, and uh, up to this moment. Right. First of all, the, the, the government of the, 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 of the president, Salva Kiir, has, uh, has done a lot of, a lot of things through uh, difficult times. Mm. First of all, it, uh, it was the issue of the CPA implementation. Right, the and Comprehensive has, Peace Agreement. Uh, yes, and he, and he has led us through that uh, period. He has, he has supervised over the, 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 the CPA supplement, uh, implementation. Mm -hmm. He has achieved the, the, the referendum. He has achieved uh, the, the, the independence. These are things uh, the, the, that goals that uh, we set during that time and we've achieved. How we have you... opened the schools. We have, we have built hospitals. We have opened roads. These are things that we have achieved. Corruption is there everywhere in, in this world. And the government is doing its best to minimize corruption. It has been uh, an issue and we have established uh, an institution that uh, deals with, with corruption. Uh, the, the, there, is, there is an institution for that. Do and they, even the, in the do, constitution, we do have addressed have, that. Do, yeah, the, the institutions might be there mm. uh, on paper, but in practice, do they, in fact, have the teeth that can bite? Yes, yeah, they, they have been given teeth in the new constitution that they can sue, they can arrest, they can sue. Yeah, and they have, they have been empowered I by see. the constitution. I see. That, that, that is something that we, we, we have done. So, so it, we, we need to fight it. Uh, as a government mm -hmm. and as, mm -hmm. as, as, as a community. I hear you. Yeah. Mariuma, do you have any more feedback to share with the audience, please? Absolutely. Uh, we'll move on uh, to a posting from Joseph uh, Makale in uh, Lusaka, Zambia, who writes, The solution to this kind of hostility lies in the ability of President Salva Kiir and Riek Machar to find peace in their hearts and room to forgive and tolerate each other. They must find space for compromise for the sake of their people. Well, let's look at another comment, this time from Mohamed Ahmed Mansour uh, from Monrovia in Liberia, who says, only the people of South Sudan can stop the suffering of their people. Nobody else can do that. President Salva Kiir and Riek Machar should both cultivate a sense of compassion so they can come together and reconcile their differences both sides should stop the fighting and return to peaceful dialogue. Well, Shaka, a wide a range of opinions here, uh, but nevertheless compassionate to the South Sudanese people in general. And I think the earlier question had to do with the ABA situation, uh, that they wanted to find out what happened to that. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Yeah, what about uh, what you just heard, uh, for example, uh, John, uh, especially the ambassador's, in fact, a reference to the CPA. Mm -hmm. There's no question that uh, President Salva Kiir has been able to steer the country through the period of CPA, which was 2005 up to, was it 2011 when you got your independence, correct? Correct, correct. Yeah, but what about the fact that uh, when you read again the African Union Commission leaked report, it finds a lot of problems, in fact, with the CPA. It says the CPA, which of course uh, is a brainchild, really, of the IGAD, you know, countries mm -hmm. and the Troika. Yes. The United States, uh, the United Kingdom and Norway. That, in fact, uh, it was faulty because it illegitimized any group, for example, that had a gun and also introduced what they characterize as the rule of the gun as opposed to the rule of law. The CPA had its own, uh, you know, shortfalls. A lot of uh, commentators, political observers have said several times that the CPA was a, a negotiation between the SPLM and the National Congress Party, that's the ruling party in Sudan. The other political forces in South Sudan were sidelined. And so when SPLA got the legitimacy through the CPA mm. to be the ruling party in right. South Sudan, right. it came with a lot of uh, other problems. For instance, the SPLA came when they assumed power, they took over the parliament, 99% was SPLM. Right. And so decisions of the parliament were based on uh, party line as opposed to the interests of the country. And a lot of other political parties 
were making noise, but their efforts were not uh, heard that much. For instance, Dr. Lama called, got frustrated, and he formed his own party because he said, we cannot run the country like this. This is not what we fought for. That is now, interesting coming, because coming Lama Kor, of course, uh, you should uh, make reference to the fact that uh, he was, in fact, uh, the Sudanese Foreign Affairs Minister uh, during the CPA, indeed, correct? Indeed, he was. Part of it. But when, when, <laughs> when, when he came to Juba and he started making noise about certain issues that he sees not going right, and he formed his own party called uh, the SPLM uh, DC, Democratic, mm -hmm. uh, SPLM Democratic for Democratic change. Democratic change. Yes. Now, Democracy without Democrats. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll not comment on that. But let me come back I, to I what His Excellency, by, the yeah, Ambassador. President Salvaquil, I remember interviewing him, in fact, uh, in Pretoria, in the Pretoria Sheraton. And he, when I raised the issue of uh, Lama Koro saying that uh, the SPRM was undemocratic, he shot back to me and said, Shaka, between <laughs> me and Lama Koro, who is a Shuruk prince, who is more democratic than the other? <laughs> yeah, hmm? I, I, I think uh, the, the issue of CPA, CPA was uh, to reference the, 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 the league report. Hmm. CPA was, was achieved through the Battle of Guns. Yes. And the issue of the guns that they, were, they referred to. Yes. The guns were there to protect the CPA. Yes. Otherwise, we would have not arrived at the point that we had the, Correct. the refer referendum. Correct. So, is Sudan better than uh, better, better now without South? Or if we go back to Sudan, will we be much better? Or will Sudan be better? I don't think so. I'll come. So, this is, this is the, 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 the issue. The issue of the SPLM domination of the, of the parliament. We had elections where everybody participated. And actually, the other uh, Lama called form his democratic forum before the elections. We'll, we'll and come, he came to the elections and he won four seats in the parliament. We'll come he's to now that, having we'll come he's, to that he's a position issue. party now in, in parliament. We'll come so, to that issue because it, So decision at the parliament were arrived uh, by, by parliament because of democratic process. We'll parliament is representative of the people. We'll come back to that later because Lama Kor, of course, will tell you that what you call elections, in his view, are perhaps selections. But he participated and he won four seats. We'll come. We'll come back to that. Yeah. Thanks, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, that will do it for today's social media segment. Thanks to our guests uh, for chipping in. I hope they'll be able uh, to address the uh, audience's concerns and uh, clarify certain things about the current situation. And one more thanks to uh, Your Excellency, of course, the newest uh, South Sudanese ambassador to the United States, whom I had the pleasure of sitting down and doing an interview with last week before the March 5th uh, mediation deadline. Well, just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please, please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Just subscribe to VOA TV to Africa. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. Now, let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, land reform. Despite the end of colonialism rule and apartheid, vast amounts of land in Zimbabwe and South Africa and other regions on the continent are not being redistributed fairly and efficiently. We'll discuss this issue and more next week right here on Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. Uh, we're talking about the implications of the stalled South Sudan peace talks in the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa. Garang Ding Akwong, the South Sudanese ambassador to the United States, and John Tanza Mabusu, managing editor and host of Voice of America's South Sudan in Focus. Well, I have to say that uh, um, Garang and John, once again, I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the two of you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thanks, Shaka. You're most welcome, sirs. Well, we're talking again about... Uh, the CPA, uh, we're talking about uh, democracy, all our COVID uh, in South Sudan. Of course, democracy is a process. Uh, it's neither an incident uh, nor an event. So we can give you the benefit of the doubt. 
But, but what about some who say, frankly, that uh, when you look at uh, these peace talks that uh, have been going on, uh, that perhaps you can't expect what someone has characterized as a quick fix hmm, of power sharing agreement, really, because it simply doesn't work. Because this person, in fact, says when you look at the chemistry between the two principles, that there is really no chemistry. That they have sat in rooms and stuff like that, but they spend a lot of time trying to avoid each other, really. You've been to Addis Ababa? Yes, um, but I came from Addis uh, four days ago. And uh, I have seen that. I've seen a bit of that. But when I spoke to delegates from the two groups, I asked one question. When President Kiir and uh, rebel leader Riek Machar are sitting face to face, they, do they talk to <coughs> each other? They told me, no, when they are there, it's normal. They talk to each other, they make jokes. But when it comes to the issues mm. that uh, brought them together, right. they don't see each other eye to eye. They don't. They don't see each other eye to eye because they, you see, there is a compatible goal that these two leaders are uh, striving to achieve. Which and is? And it is the seat. The seat, the, the presidency. Seat, the presidency. But what about perhaps uh, the perceived pressure from their supporters, really? Well, when I, what I saw in Addis was that most of these delegates who came from the two sides have no power to decide. They have to wait for the principles to look at their recommendations and pass it. I see. I so see. if there is pressure from the supporters, then these supporters ought to have been given the powers to really, you know, make a final conclusion. I, I, I hate to disappoint you, uh, my colleague John, because time happens not to be our best ally right now. A reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. To participate in our discussion, please call us at 202-619-3111. US country code is one. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away. Nearly $2 billion are needed to assist the conflict victims and refugees. Four million people are at risk of famine. Between 1.1 and 1.5 million people have been displaced. Almost 117,000 South Sudanese refugees have fled to Uganda since December. Nearly 102,000 or 87 percent of the refugees are women and children. The International Crisis Group estimates that at least 50,000 people have been killed during the conflict. Nigeria heads to the polls March 28th for a landmark election. What happens there matters throughout Africa. Turn to Voice of America for the facts. VOA reporters are in Nigeria and surrounding countries covering the campaigns and the issues and counting down to the March 28th election and beyond. Special Nigeria Decides 2015 coverage is underway now. A commitment to Africa from Voice of America. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Esther Gidui, thank you so much. Uh, uh, let me come to you, uh, um, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, of course, uh, there is talk, frankly, about uh, having African solutions to African problems. What happened? Well, it is, uh, it is good in, in principle, uh, but also as African, uh, Africans, we have weaknesses in our institutions. Mm -hmm. And that's why we always run to our friends in the, in the UN or in the West to help us uh, to arrive to our problems. Mm. Uh, the current peace talks in, uh, in, in Addis Ababa, I, I think they are failing, but they will succeed one day. Mm. From uh, Dr. Riek's contribution, remains uh, about three, uh, remain three, three, three issues. Mm. 
the, if the, if, the, if the, the government has accepted in principle right. the issue of the, the of the federalism, right. it has been accepted. Right. Why, but should, why should that be a very difficult thing? This is what, what we need to ask Victoria because the government has accepted it. If there are details, details, details have, have to be arrived at in, 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 in a process, a very long process, and that will involve even constitution. But Mr. Ambassador, really, you have to do something that, that, because, let's face it, uh, yeah. you, first of all, your country is very huge. Yes. With very few people. Yeah. Incredible natural resources, really. Yeah. You have oil, you have gold, you have uncultivated miles and miles of land. I've had the opportunity to fly over South Sudan, go to Wau, go to Jongle, and all those places. Why can't you sit together and figure out the way forward? Yes, the way forward has been clear. The government gave a lot of concessions. The president gave a lot of concessions. He conceded uh, a lot of th things to the, to the rebels. But the rebels have, uh, have been shifting the goalposts from time to time to, to different locations. But the and rebels this, this, also this, this say that, in fact, this, it this is... is the pro this is the problem we have. And now we need the third party to come with the, with the third way. It is very interesting yeah. that you say yeah. that, frankly, because uh, you could be right, but uh, at the same time, you also have the rebels, in fact, saying it is Juba shifting... They got posts. That is not true. And you are both South Sudanese. That is not true. First of all, they said that they wanted the president out. When the international community and uh, told them that this is not possible, they said, okay, we need the uh, prime minister. The president said, yes, okay, take prime minister. They said, no, we need first vice president. They said, take the, we will make, uh, make you to make two, two vice presidents. Very they said, no. Now, now who's, who's changing the, uh, the, the gold post now? It is, it is the rebels. Very interesting. Huh? Um, I'm being told that uh, we have to go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Uh, good evening. Uh, is it Benny? Benny from Uganda or Benny's from Uganda? You're most welcome straight talk Africa. Good evening, Shaka and, uh, and the ambassador to the United States. Huge and terrific. How are you today? Mm, we are fairly okay, only that Uganda, in this northern part of the country, is very extremely hot. Oh, really? Is that where you are? <laughs> yeah, that is where I am. Precisely where? Lira, uh, Lira, Lira town. Yeah, it used to be a beautiful place. I've uh, been there a couple of times. Yeah, you should come again. Oh, you're most welcome. You bet I'll be there. So what's your question, my brother? Yeah, I just want to, to, to make a comment on the failure of uh, the peace agreement to be signed by the two parties. Uh -huh. I just want to refer you. I am happy that you are quite calm with what happens in Africa, and more especially in this region. Mm -hmm. It is indeed good with killing most of our African continent and countries. Mm -hmm. Because most African leaders, if it is not them, then nobody else can do it. Right. We have in Africa only on strong visionary men, mm. only one who's there, only, only one man who that can deliver, who calls the colleague the wants. And it's not surprising that this is even the city has not delivered. Mm -hmm. I had seen the failure beginning from the IGAD. You know the leadership of IGAD. Yes. Before we go ahead to, bl to, to blame the African Union, you blame the, the IGAD. Look at the members of IGAD. Why do you have to blame the IGAD? Uh, are you suggesting that uh, it may in fact not be part of a solution, but perhaps in fact yep. part of the problem, if not the problem? It could have been part of the solution, but they have become a very big mammoth of the, of the problems in the, in the, in the CPA. Specifically, who are you talking you know, about you know. now? Specifically, who are you talking about now? Because <laughs> we know, for example, that uh, your country is the only member yeah. of Uyghur that I know has troops in South Sudan that are partisan. Not by is partisan. It? They are partisan. They are partisan. That is even my complaint. That is even my worry. The all members of IGAD has, uh, has not uh, presented themselves to be partisan, but our own membership and as a country has determined itself to be partisan, and they are not even willing to pull out. To, we are talking about giving African solution to African problems. But what but about the is, argument, what common. about Kampala's argument, really, that uh, if, in fact, the Ugandan army had not gone there to secure the airport in Juba and some other places, for example, in Bor? that there could probably have actually been a genocide there. Yeah, it, it could have been there. It could have been there. It couldn't even have been there as well. Remember, these are the same community. 
and this same community will not even wish to come to, to clandestinely kill the other the other sect the, the other sex or wow. the other ethnic group i will not believe so thank you is thank you very much thank you very much i think your point uh, is well made uh, let me come to you, uh, John, really. Uh, you know as well as I do yes. uh, <clears throat> that uh, this lady, this great lady, uh, Hilda Johnson, used to be the United Nations Secretary General's special representative to South Sudan. She has written a very interesting book, and uh, among other things, in that book, she in fact says that your country needs to be rebooted like a computer, that there are no quick fix, no deal, will do it. And in fact, she is supported by the Troika ambassadors also. According to the leaked report again, in their first meeting with the commission, they actually agreed with her. They wanted, for example, to make sure that uh, the two principles step aside so that your country can begin anew. Why do you think somebody can begin really using an, you know, a metaphor of a computer? It's because the conflict in South Sudan is so complex in its nature. If you look at the fabric of the society, the conflict is embedded in the fabric. And so for you to address it, you need to remove the layers one by one and look at them carefully. What is happening in South Sudan is that Yes, for now, a lot of people have been burying the fact that this conflict has boiled down to ethnicity. Ethnicity. And but when, is that true? When, when I went to Addis and asked the delegates and the civil society, they said, no, this is not an ethnic conflict. It is a political conflict. It is a conflict between two leaders who have disagreed from one party, mm -hmm. and uh, the issues of the disagreement are... Uh, issues that affect everybody in the country. For instance, the lack of democracy. In, in, in South Sudan, I met a lot of journalists in Addis Ababa who told me that they self-censored themselves. They could not write what they want to write because they will be arrested. There is no freedom of speech. Let me and so it boils down to democratization of the society. Time is not our best ally. We have only one minute, Mr. Ambassador. I really want to ask you a very, in, very important question here. John mentioned the issue of ethnicity. You don't eat your ethnicity. I don't eat my ethnicity. It is only when I am in trouble sometimes, at least in the context of Africa, that I begin to mobilize the support of the people with whom we share that clanship. When I steal, I steal for myself. I am patriotic to my stomach, not to my ethnicity. So why should people be misled along those lines, really? Yeah, this is the question we are asking ourselves. Why should the, the rebels mobilize themselves along ethnic line? And we and, and we government we did not we did not do that. No, the you can't, you can't say that. So you know what happened in out, Juba. The president came out out twice after the conflict. He came out twice, and I was there in those two 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 two, two, two occasions. He said that if you are my supporter, don't kill any newer. I know, I, I know he came he later, that but, he, but, the, but... my the, supporter, don't kill in, in, anywhere. But if so you the go at the, the date of the 16th and, let, and, let me, and let 17th me finish. and let, the 18th... Let me finish. Unfortunately, and to my, my and, unfortunately time really yeah. is not my best ally. Yeah, thank you, my, There's no thank democracy you. here. I have to go if they say I have to go. On that note, thanks to our distinguished guests, Garang Ding Akwong, the South Sudanese ambassador to the United States, John Tanza Mabusu, managing editor and host of Voice of America's South Sudan in Focus, and Dr. Riak Machar, chairman of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement in opposition. He joined us earlier via telephone link up from the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. Thanks to our field stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning's Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better South Sudan and Africa, not beta. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.